Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Dead Horse podcast. I'm Ashwin, your host for the day, and with me are my co-hosts Vivek hey. and Arvind. Hello. So the idea for the week is two segments. The first where we kind of address a fundamental question about games and then we catch up on some new stories for this week. So we start off with something that's pretty fundamental to games. What makes a game stick with you? To provide some more context, I was playing Dishonored a bit back, but even though I found it a very polished experience and ter- enjoyed it a lot, I found that a month down the line, I didn't remember much about the game. So it didn't really stick with me and come back to me and make me think a lot about it. So this made me wonder what what exactly it is, that the secret sauce that makes some games great and some others not so great. This is a very subjective thing, of course. So, why did a very polished experience not stick with me? So, to further expand on this, I think we'll go around the table and ask everyone what they think about this. So, Vivek, what do you think? Have you had similar experiences with games where you found it to be really good when you played it, but didn't really stick with you later on? Yeah, that, that tends to happen uh, to me a lot with uh, shooter games. Very few shooters stick with me after I've played them. Uh, but like the, the games that stick with me, I find, are games in which there are ev- not just events, not just events or missions, but there are certain instances, other than system-driven uh, instances where you know something random happens because of the way the systems in the game interact that you don't expect, uh, and like it's just a great moment, that's when a game sticks with you. But in narrative-driven, like, corridor shooters and linear games, I think it's kind of hard to leave an, a permanent impression on your on your head. Uh, yeah, that's that's my take on it. Uh, Arvind, what do you think? Yeah, like, what makes a game memorable for me is, like, I don't even think there's a formula as such, because sometimes I find games that annoy me too much as memorable as the ones that I really like. Some of the games I remember the most are... Games I played when I was just starting to play video games. Some RPG maker role-playing games. A series called Laxius Power and Virtua Fighter 2. Uh, that's another one which yeah, me and my brother spent like a lot of time playing versus mode in. And yeah, Deus Ex, obviously. Um, yeah, so that like I don't think there's a pattern to it as such. Yeah, I don't know if there's a way to quantify it or not. I think that's what like we should probably discuss, as in like how do you quantify that feeling maybe? So this this also brings into question some other factors. Like when I thought more about this, you brought up the case of early games that you played, right? So is it because you had very little choice at that time that you think that this this stuck with you? Like now we are spoiled by pictures. We have the entire Steam library in front of us. So do you think that is a factor? Nostalgia is potent. Yeah, it's, it can be extremely potent, and you can lionize games that you played in the past as these ide- ideal, ideal experiences when they might not actually live up to the fantasy that you've built up in your head. I think that's an interesting line of thought. That early, when you do earlier on in the games cycle, when we didn't have that many games to choose from, whatever we got was precious, and we remember a lot of it. But uh, once we have choices, we kind of start becoming more analytical about the games we play. Arvind, what do you think? Hmm, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, nostalgia is obviously a very well uh, like established factor. Several media empires, I think, have been built on nostalgia. So, so, so yeah, nostalgia is almost definitely a factor. You see it now in games and like Kickstarters, both of them. You have like several old franchises coming back and getting a lot of success just based on the name, like not even with a playable product. So yeah, yeah, nostalgia is definitely a thing. And another cause is that at that point of time, you uh, you didn't have a lot of choice. So what you, so you were forced to uh, devote yourself to a game for much longer. Like right now, I have like a hundred game backlog on Steam. So like if if a game try annoys me, I'm I'm more likely to move on and play something else. In the olden days, I had like two or three games at max to choose from. So yeah, yeah there was a lot less choice back then. 
I remember spending hours trying to get uh, GTA Vice City to run on my uh, dilapidated computer. Yeah, I think I think definitely the idea of nostalgia is important. Yeah. But the other thing that I think is important, I, I was watching a GDC lecture the other day of a game that I haven't played, but by all accounts is an extremely memorable game for a lot of people and the people who have played it say a lot of, uh, like, there's a lot of praise it's received, even though mechanically it's a completely broken game. I'm talking about uh, Deadly Premonition by... Uh, sweary and it's supposed to be this amazing game because the world that it's built in is extremely memorable and uh, they did that by having every character in the game every npc has a 24 hour action table and i think on a daily basis their action table changes a little bit and you can walk into their houses you can break into people's houses and see the things that they have inside them and uh, the player character has to do mundane things like like eat and shave and take a bath on a regular basis so that they don't stink. And I think that also adds uh, a little bit. I think another thing that adds stickability to games is when you relate deeply to a player character or when you start putting things that you do on a daily basis like smoking or, well, eating, everybody eats. But, uh, but when you start relating daily, everyday things like shaving to something a character is doing in a game, which is really, really rare. Games don't like to be mundane for obvious reasons. Uh, but when you start relating those things to a game, I think it becomes more memorable. I don't know if, if that necessarily makes a game a better game to play, but they definitely start have more like stickability at that point in time. Anyway, that's yeah, that's my two cents. I think of say Heavy Rain, which did almost just that. Yeah, change nappies. Yes. So, yeah. But. <laughs> it was hardly memorable. So probably it's in the execution. Yeah, I think it might also be in the execution uh, for sure. I think the the other thing Deadly Premonition does it also gives the player a lot more freedom. The the guy who designed it talks specifically about allowing the player to go to specifically leave a quest at any point of time if they wanted to go off and do something completely different, and to always encourage and acknowledge that whatever the player is doing is the right way to play things. There's definitely a wrong way to play heavy rain. And you kind of feel sometimes that the game is mocking you for playing it the wrong way. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the ability to perform mundane tasks is slightly related to the fact that, like, at least what I think that is that earlier, like, games could incorporate a lot more uh, strange design elements as opposed to, like, what the freedom that mass market games are allowed right now. I think that is also a factor. Like, when a game has to, uh, like, conform to a like very specific checklist and like try not to offend anyone or like try to retain the maximum number of players in a bit to polish off of the rough edges yeah that also uh, removes some of the appeal uh, that like people might find in it so like in the quest to get like let's say a million dedicated players perhaps the game games that would have had uh, just a hundred thousand dedicated players with the more uh, eccentric design elements probably lose some some of that like yeah, the the ability to be memorable. Yeah, that that comes with eccentricity sometimes. Although sometimes eccentricity can just be madness. Um, Ashwin pointed out heavy rain, which is a good example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like not all yeah. forms of eccentric design are necessarily good. Yeah, yeah, but like sometimes like uh, like a little bit of that is is needed to like elevate a game from its competition and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. I think one of the most memorable games I have played, which is kind of a combination of, uh, you know, the things that come in standard AAA franchises, along with the, the more mundane, everyday sort of life, is Yakuza 3. It's one of the most memorable games I have ever played. Uh, and it involves, like, you play as a gangster, a reformed gangster, who's now taking care of children in an orphanage. And uh, the land on which your orphanage is is being grabbed by corporations so that they can extend the... American military base that's on the island of Okinawa and in the middle of all that you you have a brawl outside the Japanese parliament and uh, it's it's hilarious you have a you have there's a yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure that's like an accurate recreation of uh, 90s Japan yeah <laughs> yeah I think I think they nailed 90s Japan perfectly uh, but yeah Yakuza 3 I think is one of the few games that I have a very clear memory of almost every moment in that game and that's a very rare thing for me. Ashwin, you played Yakuza 3 as well, did you? Uh, is that something, did you find that memorable at all or have you forgotten completely about it? Yeah, yeah. 
I know the, all of this podcast is in very subjective territory. I found your quiz three very memorable too. In fact, all of it was either over the top or you were trying to hit a very uh, a sober note, and it was a wild ride. Seriously. Yeah. I think yeah. one one dishonored maybe took itself too seriously. Is that probably why it, it felt like any other triple A game to me? Maybe. The other game that I felt exactly the same about was Gears of War, which again I thought took itself very seriously. Like uh, let's do it right, like how a AAA game should be done. And maybe the lack of eccentricity is what made it non-memorable. That's a theory. Yeah. But we'll leave this on to another question that I would like to ask you both, since you're working on your own games now and designing them. So Arvind, how would you test your game for memorability? what would be your would you have a test i know there is no formula but how would you go about hmm well like i'm not sure how to uh, test specifically for like if the game is memorable because that's uh, very subjective but like what i usually do is uh, like if i ask somebody to play the game then like maybe a month or two afterwards like the next time i want to extend like, a build to for them to test i'll just ask them what what they remember for, from the game previously So yeah, but yeah, like this is the kind of thing that's really very hard to uh, measure because some every like every person would have different standards for something like a player person who plays a lot of role playing games. They would probably have a very high bar set for narrative and like combat design and such. But at the same time, if a person is like an adventure game player, they would have a very different idea for how memorable something is. So yeah, that's. Like I'm not like at this point. I'm not even sure myself how to specifically test for like how memorable my game is. Like apart from You're the right. usual testing, how you do? I I think you know I think there is no fixed answer for that. All I thought was uh, that would give a peek into your minds so that anybody listening to this would understand what goes through your mind when designing a game. That's all. So I'll yeah I'll put the same question to Vivek now. How would you go about it, Vivek? Well, for me, what I'm trying to do is. Uh, at the moment i'm thinking of my game solely as uh, systems narrative is not something that i thought of very clearly with what i'm doing so far i'm looking at the systems and i'm not consciously trying to create uh, systems that uh, when you when they come together they just go nuts but i'm hoping that the disparate like systems that i have of stealth and of the puzzle systems that i have that are uh, kind of inherent in the game when they come together the combination of events that happen uh, or the ways the player can use those systems together will kind of make the game memorable because i find that games that are system driven purely system driven are generally easier to remember or e- fall generally f- easily fall into that uh, category of stickable in in people's heads uh, according to me that's what i'm trying to do right now i don't know if i'll be successful at it until you know someone plays the game Oh, yeah, none no, of no, us know. I'm pretty sure. So I'll, I'll give you an example uh, if you want. So uh, there's there's AI in my game, and there are multiple ways that you can hide from AI, and you can throw a bomb. That you can plant a bomb and wait for the AI to uh, wait for the enemy uh, to come to a certain place and then explode the bomb. Uh, you can set off a chain reaction where there are certain physics objects piled off in a certain way if you set off a bomb next to those objects they'll fall and uh, if if they fall like if you place the bomb correctly they'll fall on top of the ai and create a chain reaction of sorts those are two small examples that kind of show i don't know if they give a very clear example of what i'm going for but they kind of show the direction i'm thinking in as in system driven stuff wherein you have the player has a set of tools that help them do hopefully cool things in in the world so ultimately you're going for more more minecraft than say planescape torment is that right more thief than planescape torment <laughs> would be a better way to phrase it well yeah i just went extreme i suppose yeah. so i'll wrap this up with an anecdote i just remember about this music composer who would compose always in the night at 2 in the night he would compose a tune then go to sleep and f- and first thing in the morning he would try to recollect that tune if it didn't come to him without any effort he would ditch it right away he would say it's not memorable so yeah that's one test i guess work for him <laughs> we we'll, we'll move on to 
uh, the news section topic. If you guys do not have any other thoughts on this, what do you think? Sure, yeah, we can. There was, was one other thing which I was kind of wondering about our perception of games that we play. How much are they affected by external factors like your peer group, your online discussions, uh, who you follow on Twitter, stuff like this? Do you have any good thoughts on that? Like, is that why some games stick with you and some games don't? Like, you're influenced by uh, the uh, the things around the game, the ecosystem around the game. Uh, like, obviously, some of the discussion is like some games are actively built to encourage that. Like, for example, Fez with its with its code breaking kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it was explicitly built to encourage players to work to work together in offline and decode stuff and that. But yeah, other than that, obviously, since we are human beings, I presume our minds are affected by discussion around the game and what the game tries to be. For example, Stanley Parable, a, a major chunk of its charm is because of how narrative is handled in other games from Stanley Parable. If Stanley Parable were the only game, I think its effect would be a lot less mind blowing than what we have right now. So yeah, I think yeah, it's affected, but not in a very uh, overwhelming way. Twitter alone cannot convince me that like a game that I don't like is suddenly like the best game ever. Obviously, what your friends say and like what sites you read say, like that that stuff obviously affects you. But I think overall, yeah, it it's probably it it is probably 10%, like more closer to 10% of the opinion. And ultimately, like if a game cannot stand on its own when you are playing it. then no amount of positive press or twitter buzz will be able to save it yeah i think that's what like microsoft plans to do with with the xbox so, like they you have twitter running side by side <laughs> in your tv so like maybe if the if the game sucks then twitter will be able to convince you that the game is actually good well uh, i think i think games are largely personal experiences so yeah arvin's right in that sense that you know the experience you have with a game pretty much makes or breaks on an individual level what people think of the game decides you know whether or not they like it for multiplayer games like dota and like league of legends kind of thing what kind of players you have paired with at the start greatly colors your experience of the game and i think that's why like like the people who are like at valve and like riot are t- trying to make their community a lot more positive and such because having a like the first few games in which you obviously suck be poisonous experiences would probably turn you off the game for good yeah so in multiplayer games the community obviously uh, matters a lot yeah i also think that in multiplayer games largely these days the focus on multiplayer games has become because of how toxic uh, video game communities can be at times i think uh, largely multiplayer games people tend to play with their friends now so i still think it does i think peer groups do affect, like your friends thinking something about a game will affect you one way or another because I, i like borderlands too but i like it because i'm playing it with my friends you know <laughs> so at the end of the day i think it does matter with certain kinds of games like especially multiplayer games i i do think that people are more likely to play a, a certain kind of multiplayer game if their friends are playing it even if they don't really enjoy it that much just because they enjoy spending time with their friends yeah so your experience is is definitely influenced by who you play with but to take this to the extreme I've heard that judges, when deciding on cases, they do not read newspapers and they cut themselves off from news and the media. So, do you think reviewers should cut themselves off from mainstream media and PR and play games in a pure state? I don't think that's possible. I think that's like logistically that's impossible. A reviewer gets a lot of news uh, and like like emails from developers every day. If they were to do it, okay, I've just received this one email and I'm going to review this one game for the next two days and not talk to anyone. Like they would probably lose their job at whatever magazine they're working. So so I'm not sure if it's like logistically if it's possible. Like ideally, maybe somebody could put up a Kickstarter and like do an experiment or something. but i don't think in the real world that's possible right now i think if in an ideal scenario uh, if video game companies realize that because of the amount of cynicism that's just that just pervades all media these days selling something to any kind of game reviewer has become exponentially harder now because you can't be like i mean battlefield 4 when people come in and say it's bigger and better than the last battlefield it's the best thing ever in the history of all mankind there's a certain amount of cynicism that set in to people that have to play games day in and day out for a living that they are going to not be receptive to your spiel 
So I think if, if video game companies decide to be a little bit more subtle with the way they give games to reviewers, I think that would help. But I don't see that happening because these are large games that, that cost hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars. And to sell them, companies have to get the message out and they have to have that, you know, we, we are making the best game ever made. And the last game that you played was just a piece of shit because this new thing now, this is the real thing. This is like the game that we yeah. promised you. This is the this is the messiah of all video games. Yeah, it's not possible. Like with the amount of money that's spent on these games, a, b- a big corporation that can afford to go out, go on an all-out media blitz just cannot afford to take that risk. For example, Pepsi can maybe afford to make a subtle ad or two because like Pepsi billboards are on every single street uh, in every single country right now. But video games are not at that level of pervasiveness where you think video game and you think okay yeah call of duty or something at this point of time they have big company thinking pretty much dictates that you have to go out on an all like media blitz and just like try to saturate everyone with the information ashwin what do you think yeah more or less what you guys said i know it's, it's kind of not practical to cut yourself completely live under a rock and write virgin reviews but I also think the assumption that Arvind made, for example, that to quote you, the magazine that you're working for, I don't think that has to be the case either. You can be an independent entity, like a, a freelance reviewer. I think Tom Chick is a bit of that. Uh, there you can still have a bit of that. There you can be a little more immune to the PR spin. But there's always only a middle ground. I don't think you can, can, can completely cut yourself, cut yourself off. Yeah. So... Those are my thoughts. Oh, also, Ashwin, you never told us what makes games memorable for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, see, if I knew that, I wouldn't, uh, I would just write a book and become a millionaire, see. <laughs> I would like to... No, but on, on a subjective level, what makes a game memorable for you personally? Well, I think what what I, I have understood so far from uh, what, what both of you have said is that different things tickle us, all three of us. I could see a, a strong, probably leaning towards RPG mechanics and narrative for Arvind, while it is almost completely systems for Vivek. This could not have been a more honest discussion because you guys are actually making games and you're walking the talk of what you really like. And I think me as a person, I am more more towards narrative than systems. So I think it's a it's an entirely personal thing, but. I, I also think since there are so many segments of gamers out there, uh, you cannot really sell one genre to another genre. And because of that, if you want to distinguish yourself from other games in the same bucket, I think that's when the eccentricity and the quirkiness comes in. So if you want to stand out from the crowd in your bucket, I think you need some kind of spice and sugar there. So I think that is what on a as a local optimum, all of us can aim for. Can you make it like? I'm surprised nobody mentioned Hideo Kojima. He is <laughs> the most eccentric of his classic game developers, isn't he? So yeah. something like that. Make a true blue systems-driven narrative-heavy game with uh, 16 hours of cutscenes, and sprinkle it with some generous amounts of uh, quirkiness, and you have a successful game, I guess. There it is. Uh, for every game developer listening to this, we just gave you the formula for a short fire hit. $5 million. Well, $50, $500 million guaranteed if you use this formula to make a video game. Yeah, I was yeah. just about to say, yeah, that like $5 million these days would probably like not get you a big budget game. Yeah. What up on email? $5 million. Yeah. I think this is by far the best among us uh, when it comes to numbers. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So with that, I guess we'll wind up this segment, guys, and we'll move on to the new section, and we'll kick that off with an article that Vivek forwarded me, which was about an Ouya retrospective. Ouya, if you remember, is the Kickstarter console that came out, a micro console, and it didn't do very well, but maybe it did just okay. So what are your thoughts, Arvind? Yeah, I mean Ouya is, I think at the at, at this point probably the most visible and uh, successful micro console and yet like people are not uh, happy with it so I guess like it says something but yeah I mean having a successful console is such a uh, grind in terms of like you probably need to be in the market for like at least five years at a minimum before like people will start to take you seriously and another problem with Ouya is that they are some of their store policies 
for example uh, each game has to be free to try but since like the official store page does not require developers to list a price so often developers have uh, instead of a fixed price to buy they will have in app purchases and stuff like that so the final price of something is unknown and like people aren't uh, very like judging from the feedback i have seen in forums and such i think people are not uh, yet accustomed to uh, to just like keep spending money in the same way they spend in like facebook games or uh, certain free to play games i also think that a lot of people are kind of surprised when they suddenly hit a paywall for a game that's not an experience a lot of people are used to having on a console it's an experience they're used to maybe having on a phone might be kind of jarring for them to have a similar experience on a console uh and that's a, one thing a lot of the developers for we are complaining about it's not in terms of just sales sales were all right they didn't have very high expectations uh but i think the the way they're selling their games coupled with the recent marketing gaps that we are has made with their uh with the trailer that they had taken on and taken off and uh, i think there was another kind of misstep they made in terms of marketing with that uh, they had that funding drive that became very controversial where they said that any game that's kick started for we are will will pay half it will pay like whatever they make will pay that amount right yeah that- yeah that had a uh, like couple of very uh, i think so yeah. like i i cannot say uh, people who violated the rules because that's that was never proven uh, but at yeah. the same time they were very suspicious like in terms of uh, how how those certain games were like raising the funds and that kind of thing yeah but i think one of those games got pulled off uh, kickstarter as well ironically because the devs complained to kickstarter and say ask kickstarter to look in kickstarter and amazon to look into the payments that were made to their uh, to their campaign yeah Yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, if Kickstarter and Amazon looked at them and they found them suspicious, then like clearly something was not right somewhere. Like whether whether it was the developer doing it or like somebody else, like I don't know who. Yeah. Maybe Doctor Evil or somebody. I don't know. But yeah, like something was not wrong, like right there. And yeah, uh, Uya is, so, in, is in a bit of a pickle now. Yeah, Uya never excited me much. Not my kind of console probably, but uh, I think it rubbed off a lot of developers the wrong way because it's. Controller was kind of faulty when it shipped. Where I'm pretty sure you guys must have seen the graphs that some some devs had a go at the controller, and they found dead spots all over. You would expect an analog stick to have a perfectly circular region of sensitivity, right? This was more squarish. Huh. That gave a really wrong impression. People started thinking that the yeah, devs are kind of sloppy. So I guess that also did not help their cause. Yeah. Anyways, the last question for the night is with all the new PS4 and Xbox announcements coming out, if you had to pick between these two and for exactly one reason, which one would you pick and for what reason? Vivek? I'd pick PS4 because it has more titles coming out for it that I want to play. I'm actually interested in playing uh, Infamous Second Son. Also, I want to check out Nack. which looks really really cool the games right. it's always the games i i don't care about the media server nonsense even though the announcement today that uh, ps4 is not going to support mp3 and they're not going to support external hard drive is is nonsense and uh, they shouldn't do that it, it's com- complete nonsense but the, there are better games coming out on ps4 so that's what i'm going to buy right now cool i will uh well i don't know like like the only reason i would choose a console is like if somebody was giving it to me for free Yeah, because the cost of ownership for a console like right now is probably too much for me like so yeah like i don't know but like if i was like forced to if i had to choose between the uh, the two i would probably choose the playstation 4 because like earlier i would have said because i don't have to pay for uh, to play a multiplayer but now i cannot even say that so yeah i don't know why i would choose a console but yeah like i don't know, I'll, just, i'll probably flip a coin or something yeah Initially, I thought Arvind was going to say that if there is a PC apocalypse and all PCs die, you know, there's no PCs left, then I will go on a console hunt. Yeah, well, I mean, like consoles are like computers too. So, like, if there was a PC apocalypse, like, like computers would be gone as well. So, so like, if if somebody like selectively destroyed certain certain all types Windows of computers, and Linux PCs, yeah. all Windows and Linux PCs are gone, yeah. and Apple computers too. That's an easier way, Vivek. All you need to do is kidnap Arvind, tie him to a chair, and ask him to pick. I think even if I pointed a gun at his head, he would not pick a console. He's he's a PC gaming master race. Is Arvind's uh, slogan. Uh, yeah, like my pure like obstinateness would probably deflect 
the bullet aimed at my head so yes <laughs> <laughs> i think yeah, i think i can agree with vivek for me too it's just uh, about yeah but Uh, yeah but overall like what i don't like about like uh, like the, this generation of consoles in particular is that both uh, like sony and microsoft and like nintendo have always been doing it but like all the these companies are like hell bent on restricting what you can do with the device that you own already for example the playstation 4 should not have any problem playing mp3s because like games have multiple music tracks playing in them at the same time you can watch online video and stuff like that so Yeah, that is an artificial restriction imposed upon the device for no reason at all. Except I don't know, like maybe because Sony has this cloud cloud music service. Sony's But launching yeah, its like own paid I, music service. That's why that's why they're doing this. Yeah, like I don't like being beholden to the the whims of Sony. For for example, like if Sony suddenly decides that it wants to challenge iTunes, PlayStation Four will be its weapon. So then suddenly <laughs> I'm being forced to buy a lot of new tracks. Or for example. pretty much all the music i listen to nowadays are game soundtracks from humble bundle which i get uh, so i wouldn't be able to do that if i wanted to listen to my music on playstation 4 that's one of the reasons which like makes consoles really a very unattractive proposition in terms of value because like india doesn't like at least jaipur doesn't have a very burgeoning used games market right i cannot just go to gamestop and sell my old game and get the new one for a cheaper price So yeah, that kind of makes it very odd to play a console because you know, like especially with the lack of backward compat backwards compatibility, you know that at some point you will not be able to play the games that you already have. Whereas on PC, like people will find a way, even if you have a, a certain fondness for the original Prince of Persia, like you can get like you can play it on emulators on DOS box or whatever. So yeah, that's a kind of weird thing which helps the value proposition for me a lot. that and the price ahead, yeah. of uh, pc games in india pc games are a lot yeah like steam has yeah like i can get old games for like two like 3.75 dollars or something so that's very like attractive also flipkart yeah definitely yeah yeah they have made it very easy for us and like yeah this is the corporate sponsored part of our podcast <laughs> so like flipkart if you want video game delivered to you use flipkart <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so that was a kind of uh, I, that's kind of a weird thing because like PC games are a lot more cheaper on Flipkart. They get discounted like more often. So that's one thing which I really find very odd. Like because if at least if I was a console maker, I would probably try to like like get more people to buy consoles by like pricing them at the same range where yeah uh, like the PC games are made because like disc manufacturing costs are very cheap in India. Like whatever it costs in the US or like UK or whatever. It's definitely cheaper here to make game discs. Yeah, but the problem is, I think that game discs for uh, the the PS3 and 360 games aren't made in India. Game discs for the PC games are made in India, and I think they need to so get to a point. So why is that? I have no idea. They're hiding certain yeah, because, technology from us because we'll steal it from them. I don't know. Yeah, but even if people steal the like magic technology to burn games on a Blu-ray disc from PlayStation like factories. like they don't have their own console to make it from like making a playstation 4 homebrew will probably cost you around at least 10 times and i am being very optimistic because these consoles are already being sold on a loss like if somebody just has it in their head where will they get the custom made amd parts from like they would have to raid amd factories i'm not sure if that's even possible so i don't know yeah they should just make console discs in india and sell them at 1000 rupees the the sales will shoot up exponentially Uh, I'm guaranteeing yeah. that more people will buy their games if they bring uh, bring it down to the thousand rupee mark. Now is the perfect time, actually, for 360 and PS3 games in India to hit the thousand rupee mark. Now is the perfect time because we have a decent number of people who will buy these games. A lot of these games now because the next yeah. generation is starting and PS3 and 360 are a lot more affordable now for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, like for me at least, like if if I was to buy a a console, like the the attractive price range would probably be like something around ten thousand rupees or fifteen thousand for the console itself, and like the nine ninety nine mark for the video games. Because otherwise, it just becomes prohibitively expensive. Like if you get a good computer, you can do other stuff on it. Like I can yeah. make my own games on it. Like but I cannot do that on a console. So it's a a one purpose device for me because like I don't. use like i don't plan to use skype or like watch the nfl on my console so yeah. so and they don't stream so yeah, cricket matches 
yeah that's another problem yeah like a lot of stuff is it's just cut out because of like india is not one of the prime regions yeah i think yeah overall consoles yet don't have the same value proposition like that computer games have plus like a lot of freeware games like uh, like you have those certain very good games get released uh, for free you can play them on the pc i'm thinking cave story there's this another game that's like save the date that kind of stuff it opens you up to a lot more like esoteric stuff where you are just where you can just download a 50 mb zip and play it and then throw it away that kind of stuff yeah uh, for me yeah it's again it comes down to the quality of the game when picking a console most of alvin's arguments against consoles are pretty valid they are kind of uh, anytime well not just consoles any closed system in fact this is exactly what say windows does to you or say an iphone does to you where they severely limit what you can do consoles just happen to be an extreme form of that where you can't do anything like arvin said you can't create anything on it they they are not devices meant for creation just for consumption but uh, the other thing that is very lucrative about consoles is the fact that they're stupid you can just plug and play and that is a very attractive proposition to a lot of people and not particularly in the indian market maybe but in other markets definitely that is a, a drive point most people don't want to create games that's a fact most people don't want to create yeah. anything else. they're happy just watching stuff yeah i think like stuff. yeah so i was uh, reading an article like from an uh, indian manufacturer about manufacturer about how to uh, package games for the southeast asian market and like the advice in the article was like if something like uh, removing an extra makes it cheaper for you like even the even the manual if removing the manual makes it cheaper do that because people will like people are willing to jump through a lot more hoops like somebody will uh, like look it up on google like the control scheme or something uh yeah and like if if something makes it even a dollar cheaper like do that because that's what like sells games in the market like cost is a huge uh like a huge thing for us compared to uh, like the european and the american markets yeah so yeah so that was good to hear about the new consoles that are coming up plus our thoughts on whether the consoles should exist or not are they a humongous threat to the society and so on but apart from that we would also love to hear what arvind and vivek have been working on this week uh, so why don't you go vivek tell us what you've been doing i've been working on ai this week uh, basically i've finished the pathfinding stuff and i've moved on to uh, how ai uh, behaves once they've detected the enemy uh, once they detected the player and started coding in uh, you know basic search routines and attack attack uh, patterns Yeah. Once that's done, I can start finally working on it. Right. So, it's the last stretch of uh, mechanical development before I start going into making games, seeing how it, like actually building the, taking the parts and putting them together and see how they play with each other. Yeah. So I'm excited. So it's not the, the so it's it's not yet ready for the world yet, is it? Uh, yeah, you can say that. And uh, Arvind, how's Andres coming along? Yeah, I mean, yeah. At the, this week, we've almost uh, finished like chapter four of the main quest, which is like fifty percent of the like the main quest. So hopefully, we'll be able to finish off the main quest soon and then move on to the side stuff. But yeah, overall, yeah, it's progressing pretty well. Yeah, like I, I'm almost done with controller support and like the like keyboard support as well. Like both of them are like going on simultaneously. So yeah. and like by keyboard support i mean it already supports keyboard but like if you want to navigate menus in like the game entirely by via the keyboard without the mouse yeah, that's almost possible to now so yeah that's yeah that's the kind of yeah, the boring ui stuff that's going on right now and once that's done yeah i'll move on to the like the rts style control scheme so yeah it's it's all control schemes and such at the moment i'm also preparing my uh, like talk that i'm going to give at ngdc so yeah like if one if some of our viewers want to visit that maybe i don't know <laughs> you're also selling copies of unrest at ngdc so tell everyone to bring their wallets yeah yeah like bring all your money so i can change <laughs> it in exchange for like unrest copies yeah no like i have like uh, 
like small pieces of paper with the keys in them like i'll be handing them off in envelopes and stuff like okay. that so it's like 500 rupees for the basic copy and like 1000 for a special edition so like just like doing the whole sell out routine right here so yeah <laughs> special edition with the art book and the soundtrack and developer commentary arvin yeah and the posters too here yeah, so oh that's cool i i i was hoping that to to sell your game at ngdc you'd make people go on a scavenger hunt and then finally they'd end up at una station or some other other cd location in in una and uh, they'd have to go uh, tumhare paas maal hai and then you'd say ha mere paas <laughs> maal hai tumne paisa laya hai ha yeah, 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 like in jaipur i would have yeah i would have certainly done that if it was in jaipur but like pune is a foreign city for me too so that would be much harder to do plus like i don't know how the like the mumbai mafia works like that's kind of like pune is like pretty close to there right so i assume there's a like smaller pune mafia as well Yeah, the okay. What I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> the mafia is kind of non-existent. Pune is my hometown. There's there's no mafia in Pune. It's not like Jaipur. Yeah, that's it's... what you. Yeah, that's what you will say, obviously. <laughs> you know, don't you know all the entire Pune mafia has moved to the Middle East? Yeah. <laughs> I think you're confusing the Pune mafia with the Kerala mafia now, Arvin. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't aware that there was a mafia in Kerala. Like I thought Kerala was like, uh, like. some sort of very highly educated utopia or something it is, it is. highly educated people all are make the most deadly gangsters i mean don't you know that oh, like i don't i don't know like the all the gangster gangsters i've seen are like uneducated like 20 somethings i'm sure have like very, that's because yeah. it's the north the north has yeah. uneducated <laughs> your, your chief ministers are uneducated <laughs> gangsters so <laughs> so before we slip off from the perilous territory of consoles into the even more <laughs> perilous politics i think we'll call it a wrap for the dead horse podcast this week we yeah. wish our listeners a happy diwali and signing off our vivek hey bye guys happy diwali arvin bye and it's bye from me ashwin thanks for listening